I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the Israeli Prime Minister begins a historic trip in Argentina. Hamas finally opens up negotiations for Palestinian unity. And did you ever think that ice cream could lead to peace in the Middle East? Well, we have the scoop on just how. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has just touched down in Argentina, beginning a historic 10-day tour of Latin America. Argentinian President Mauricio Macri will be transferring the country's massive Holocaust archive over to the Jewish state during the beginning of a very, very busy tour for the Israeli Prime Minister. Well, here to tell us more is ILTV's Latin American correspondent, Joy Gavijon. Now, Joy, I know most of Argentina's Holocaust archive has never been seen before by Israel, so tell us a little bit more about it. Well, look, Argentina has a dark history of welcoming Nazis after mm -hmm. the Holocaust, but it might be right to say that the government is trying to revert this by helping reveal history through this archive. Back in June, Argentina sent more than 38,000 documents to the wow. Holocaust Museum in Washington, and now they announced the transfer of this trove to Israel, which includes scans of more than 100,000 photographs. That's, I mean, that's amazing. And, and these files are certainly going to help historians, since, as we know, Argentina is where the final solutions architect and Nazi Adolf Eichmann hid after the war. Of course. Let me tell you that that flight that brought Eichmann over to Israel for his trial, that was actually the last flight ever between Israel and Argentina until the prime minister trip just now. Right, the last direct flight. Exactly. So we could say that this was the first flight between Israel and Argentina in 57 years. With Elal. Of With course. Elal, of With course. Elal. All right, let's check it out. Shortly after landing in Buenos Aires, Netanyahu visited the site of the Israeli embassy that was bombed 25 years ago, as well as the Amian Jewish community building, the site of Argentina's worst terror attack in history. Netanyahu spoke with harsh words for Iran and Hezbollah, who are believed to be behind the bombings. I am the President of the United States of Argentina and the United States of Argentina on the right to the הגיע הזמן להטיל על איראן את האחריות המלאה באופן פומבי וסופי. In addition to build new ties with Argentina for improving trade and tourism, Argentina's president is also expected to hand over nearly 140,000 never before seen documents from the Holocaust. These documents are believed to detail Argentina's participation in the final solution, as well as the country's role in helping fugitive Nazis hit after the war, including Adolf Eichmann, who found refuge in Buenos Aires until the Mossad captured and extradited him to Israel. Netanyahu will next meet with President of Paraguay, then continue his tour to Colombia and then Mexico. With us now is someone who was actually there to personally witness the Israeli Prime Minister's historic visit in Argentina, Rabbi Yossi Turk, Rabbi and Director of Beit Chabad in Cordoba. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Hi. Hi. So, so you were there for the ceremony, right? What happened? What was it like when you saw, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu there? Well, I, I flew in from when I, I live in Cordoba, in Cordoba. Cordoba. So it's, it's an hour flight. I flew to Buenos Aires, especially for the occasion. Uh, there was a lot of uh, emotion. Uh, and the Jewish community in Argentina is very big. Right. For and South there America. Many, many Jewish organizations from all uh, sectors of, 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 of Judaism, of uh, you know, political, religious, uh, all different groups. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing that unites us all, you know, our love for, for Israel. Now, we've seen, you know, clearly some very mixed responses um, from Netanyahu's visit. Some very, very negative campaigns on social media. What is the feeling on the ground in Argentina? I mean, how are, are those who are not part of the Jewish community um, taking his visit? Generally, there is a big respect for Israel. I mean, of course, in social media, you can have one person making a lot of noise on social media. It doesn't mean it's the general uh, atmosphere or feeling among the, 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 the average person on the street. You don't see thousands of people on the streets protesting. It's just on... On, on social media, yeah. social media, you know. What, what is your greatest hope, and I guess the hope of the Jewish community, um, in terms of what will come out of this visit? It, it, it's a good question. I mean, uh, 
Israel is a central part of our, our activity. And so when, when the Prime Minister comes, acknowledges the Jewish community, mm-hmm. and the people feel they're being acknowledged, and, and it, 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 it arouses people to get involved Absolutely. and to be united and to want to visit Israel. And that is, 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 is positive for everyone. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rabbi, and uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of this visit. Yes, and uh, thank you so much, and I wish you all Shana uh, Torah in Israel and the Jewish community in Argentina. Thank you so much. All right, Israel is believed to have been behind last week's sneak attack bombing of a chemical weapons plant in Syria, which prevented devastating chemical weapons from winding up in the hands of Hezbollah. But just in case there was any concern that the terror group was gearing up to retaliate, well, it looks like they aren't looking to pick a fight with Israel anytime soon. One of Hezbollah's top commanders has just appeared on a TV interview for Arab media, saying that Israel's alleged destruction of the chemical weapons plant was not reason enough for them to go to war. If Israel is indeed behind the attack, however, it would certainly mean the Jewish state is prepared for combat. The bombing of the chemical weapons plant in Syria is a devastating military loss for both Syria and Hezbollah and is potentially Israel's biggest open use of military force in the region in at least a decade. But these reassuring words from Hezbollah mean the terror group may have a non-military response in store. Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman has also issued a threat to Syria, warning that any retaliation from Syria would end badly for them. Syria is the focus of much Israeli stress, with Iran gaining a bigger foothold in the region every day, despite assurances from Moscow that Russia will prevent Iran from establishing military forces in the area. These airstrikes in Syria happened right under Russia's nose and were potentially a wake-up call for Moscow that Israel will not tolerate any threats to its security. These are the same sentiments Prime Minister Netanyahu delivered to Russian President Vladimir Putin last month, but clearly Israel isn't afraid to act on its own security if necessary. Well, after an aggressive push for harsher sanctions in light of North Korea's most explosive nuclear test to date, the United Nations has unanimously approved new limits designed to weaken the country. This follows intense talks between the United States and China, who have convinced the rest of the UN to make severe international cuts against North Korea. Less than 10 days ago, North Korea successfully detonated its sixth and most devastating nuclear test to date, announcing the arrival of North Korea as an atomic power. The world's leaders have now fired back against North Korea's threat and have set the harshest sanctions yet. We don't take pleasure in further strengthening sanctions today. We are not looking for war. The North Korean regime has not yet passed the point of no return. If it agrees to stop its nuclear program, it can reclaim its future. If it proves it can live in peace, the world will live in peace with it. The new resolution bans natural gas liquids into the country, sets a cap on importing petroleum products from China, and forbids North Korea textile exports. All these sanctions combined promises a crippling blow to the North Korean economy and hopefully an incentive to come to the negotiating table. Israel has a lot at stake in these sanctions, especially given the long-rumored cooperations between North Korea and Iran in developing nuclear weapons, which Israel certainly hopes will never happen, just like it has in North Korea. Well, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has been pushing for a breakthrough in Israeli-African relations and was planning to launch the first ever Israel-Africa summit next month. But now it looks like the plug has just been suddenly pulled because of boycotts against African countries by Palestinians and Arab nations alike. This would have been a truly historic meeting. Campaigning on the slogan, Israel is returning to Africa, Netanyahu had hoped to gather leaders from over 50 African nations to deepen Israeli ties with the continent. But now and right as the prime minister begins a historic visit to Latin America, the foreign ministry has announced that the summit has been canceled altogether. Rumors are now flying as to why the plug was suddenly pulled, but most believe it's because of international pressure against Togo, where the conference was supposed to happen. Togo has seen thousands of protesters over the last few days, demanding the president of Togo to step down after he agreed to host the event. The president of Togo was actually in Israel last month, at which time he pledged to commit African efforts to forging ties with the Jewish state. 
These are the words that sparked harsh boycotts ever since, mostly from Palestinians and Arab nations, and unfortunately they appear to have worked. The event is officially off the books for now, with no rain check currently scheduled. Whether the BDS campaign is growing stronger or weaker is a matter of opinion, but one thing is fact, that Israel will not support it, or will it? Recent reports show Israeli government funding going to websites like YouTube that do not yet have any safeguards against being used by BDS and other anti-Israel campaigns. Well, here to tell us more about this issue is Knesset member Oded Forer of the Israel Beitenu Party. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So, so what Israeli government funds are being abused and how? The, 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 the absurd is that everyone uses the, the, those platforms like YouTube or right. Google, but um, those platforms uh, work on... on um, on uh, videos that people just upload to the network. And, and sometimes you see terrorist organizations and you see anti-Semitism organizations that upload movies right. and they have very high rates. And then they can advertise on their movies. And, and of course, it's done by the computer automatically. And you can see on those uh, websites and on those videos, you can see advertised by the Israeli government. And that's an absurd because the money that the Israeli government is paying to Google uh, right. for, for those uh, uh, advertisements actually goes at the end to those organizations which are anti-Semitism or, well, and or I racist mean, I don't organization. Think, I mean, clearly the Israeli government doesn't know that that is going, what is going to be happening, right? But then when you see something like this, all of a sudden you're questioning, well... Uh, unfortunately, I'm talking about, uh, I talk about those issues for, uh, for a year, I think, something right. like that. We had the discussion in the Knesset about that. Mm -hmm. I, I actually approached to the uh, Israel's uh, advertising uh, uh, agency and I told them, you need to stop advertising in those platforms or... You have to have an agreement with YouTube, uh, with uh, Google, that your advertisement won't be shown on videos so of anti-Semitism. Has there been uh, any movement? Yeah, I mean, th I mean, that seems basic, right? But has there been any movement so in terms of, of trying to get that done? Minister Mir Mir Regev, that's in, in charge on Israel's uh, uh, advertising uh, uh, agency, told me I will check it and, and, and I will make sure mm -hmm. that th those things doesn't happen. And then a few weeks ago, they just proposed, uh, uh, published a, a bid uh, to, to do advertising in the, in the web, and of course, I, I bless for it, it's the place to advertise now, the yeah, web. Yeah, of course. But I, I told them, why didn't you put a section that says that whoever will advertise on, on what platform we're going to advertise, they need to commit that our advertisement won't be shown on videos uploaded by anti-Semitism, uh, Nazis, or uh, terrorist organizations, uh, because actually the money, the Israeli money, will go to those organizations at the end. Well, it's just so interesting because at the end of the day, you know, these are the platforms that the world is using. It's YouTube, Facebook, and so in many senses, what is Israel supposed to do if you want to get out to a population that just goes beyond this population? It's yeah. just coming down to the, those regulations, right? Um, now, well, the, the U, I, I yeah. have to say, the UK, uh, the Britain government uh, understood that they have a, a problem, a similar problem, mm -hmm. and they called YouTube and Google and told them, you, they told to, to, to the Google uh, uh, representative, you have to prevent our advertisement from shown on those areas. I'm sure that Google, which is a very, very sophisticated platform, will know how to prevent uh, uh, advertisement from Israel to being shown on, on such a, a, a videos. So, so do those, you think those videos have many, many viewers. Do you think that there, there's actually an active change trying to be made by these organizations, these companies, or is, is there is there a block that we're I think that, that the saying? responsible is, is on the government. Government need to uh, ensure that, to this, ensure is, that yeah. this happens, and uh, they, they need to uh, actually put it as a condition. If you want advertisement, if you want budget from the Israeli government, you have to prevent this budget to go at the end, at the, at the end point, to organizations that are actually against Israel or anti-Semitism. Well, I, just, I guess we're going to just have to wait and see how, how much farther you're able to push this, you uh, know, within the Knesset. But thank you so much for joining us. At the us. end, I'm sure that we will win and, and we will prevent those uh, uh, issues. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. In the face of a crippling humanitarian crisis in Gaza, Hamas has been dramatically rewriting its strategy lately, and now they've just put a game changer on the table. Hamas has announced that they're ready to begin reconciliation talks with the Palestinian Authority's Fatah party, which could change the Palestinian world completely. 
Fatah and Hamas have been bitter rivals since 2007 when Hamas seized Gaza from President Abbas's government. This has put the Palestinian president in a difficult position since plans for a potential Palestinian state require Gaza as part of the deal. That's one of the reasons why Abbas has been fiercely applying pressure on Hamas over the last few months, by worsening the crisis in Gaza, by cutting electricity payments and even denying money for medical aid. Hamas has been seeking cooperation from both Egypt and Iran to help cement its position, but now the political head of Hamas has said his side is willing to meet with a PA and finally discuss a reconciliation. If the Palestinian Authority were able to successfully bury the hatchet with the terror group, it would place Gaza back under President Abbas's rule and put the Palestinians in a very new bargaining position in peace talks with Israel. Whether or not this will actually be good news for Israel, however, still remains to be seen. The Jewish high holidays are right around the corner, and for those of us who love the traditions and customs, one question should be starting to boil up. What Seder table is complete without the beautiful silver dishes, cutlery, wine chalices, candlesticks, and more? Well, it turns out that Hetzel Fim, the world's largest silverware manufacturer, can help. And joining us now in the studio is Rafi Friedman, the CEO of Hetzel Fim, to tell us about his company and some of their new designs. Well, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So when was your company started? Started. Okay, so Atzorfim <laughs> is a remarkable story. It was established in 1952. Okay. A uh, classical story about uh, three immigrants that uh, were refugees from the Holocaust. Right. And they were uh, they used to work uh, together uh, as silversmiths, young silversmiths in uh, Romania. They ran away, came to Israel, and established in their kitchen uh, the beginning of. Uh, this remarkable story. Yeah, what is now the, the largest silverware yes, manufacturer? Today, uh, about 65 years ago, uh, 65 years after, it's the largest uh, and leading company of silver pieces and silver Judaica pieces in the world. That's amazing. So tell us about some of the products that you manufacture and what is new for this season. Okay, so basically uh, the, what's, what's dr uh, driving the silver uh, markets is basically the Jewish uh, calendar and the Jewish right. cycle of life. And we have so, Rosh Hashanah right so around the corner. Exactly, we have Rosh Hashanah and, and for Rosh Hashanah Media. we have the uh, traditional uh, items like uh, honey dish, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, that symbols the, you know, uh, the sweet, uh, we want to, to have a sweet here. We have the knife that is a symbol for uh, good prosperity for the new year. So and do people, to, I mean this is interesting to me because are your clients people who come back and, and buy new Silverware every year, or are they keeping the silverware from your company and their family for generations silver, to come? Silver uh, pieces are eternal uh, products, of course. and they go from uh, one generation to the to the next generation. And there are people that uh, in the uh, in the religious uh, uh, in the religious community, community uh, this is the traditional. It starts uh, uh, with a young couple that starts with a, a candle, a couple of uh, candlesticks, and goes on and on and on. Yeah. And then you have the holidays that you have the menorahs, which is the biggest uh, silver uh, festival. Well, and I mean, I think it's something very beautiful because, like you said, this is an eternal product. So this, these products can be passed on from family to family. But there are new designs. What are so, what are the designs influenced by? Okay, so we are going now to upscale products like table uh, tableware. Right. We are going to a royal collection of tableware that con composed from uh, uh, under plates and all the Udaika premium, very, very, very premium, very nice. Beautiful. Well, I am sure that our viewers are going to be excited to check out your website. Thank you so much for Thank joining you very us. Much. All right, now here is an interesting story. An award-winning Lebanese filmmaker has just been honored at the Venice Film Festival, where his latest film received the coveted Best Actor Award. Now, you'd think his home country would be planning a huge welcome home party, but shortly after landing in Lebanon, the director was actually arrested instead, and it's all because he shot part of one of his last films in Israel. Lebanese director Ziad Doeri is one of the country's most acclaimed filmmakers. His latest film, The Insult, just won a huge award at the Venice Film Festival and mere days ago was selected as Lebanon's official entry into this year's Academy Awards. But when the artist arrived back in Lebanon following his win at Venice, he didn't exactly find a red carpet waiting for him. Only a group of Lebanese police who immediately detained Doeri on site and threw him in jail. The reason? 
He filmed part of his previous film, The Attack in Israel, where he spent 11 months overseeing the production and breaking Lebanese law for cooperating with Israel or even visiting the country in the first place. The attack was filmed back in 2011 and won awards all over the world, including from several major Arab film societies. So it's unclear why the charges are only surfacing now. Fortunately, though, Dwery has just been released from prison following a military tribunal in Lebanon, just in time for the premiere of his new film in the country, which opens later this week. It's the first anniversary since Holocaust survivor, Nobel laureate and author Elie Wiesel passed away at the age of 87. And a large group of the people his stories have inspired are now banding together in his honor. Well, ILTV's Aaron Porce has more on the story now. Aaron, take it away. Well, so they gathered under the banner of, of uh, anti-Semitism led to Auschwitz. They were wearing shirts and carrying placards. Mm -hmm. And as far as for Romania, why Romania? Well, they gathered in Siget in Romania, which is okay. actually where Eli Wiesel right, is from. It's his childhood home. And, uh, you know, they took to the streets wearing traditional peasant clothing, Romanian peasant clothing, and they marched from his area and they took the same path uh, that he and thousands of other Jews from the Romanian community back in World War II had to take to the trains that eventually took them to Auschwitz. Beautiful. Um, so it, it was a really beautiful and, and engaging experience. It was really uh, powerful and I'll tell you more in the report. The streets were quiet and the procession somber. For those attending though, which included both foreign and Romanian participants, it was everything they needed. Limud FSU founder Chaim Chesler, when speaking with the Times of Israel, said, We are fulfilling Eli's dream by repeating this march between his house and the train station, and that this recognition by the locals, in addition to the supporters and admirers, was a vision of Eli's for a long time, and I'm very proud to help fulfill this. Israeli leaders like M.K. Yair Lapid and Social Equality Minister Gila Gamliel were also participating in the events that commemorate not just Wiesel, but the whole of the Romanian Jewish community, a community devastated by the Holocaust. In just a few short years, the Romanian Jewish population was decimated from 850,000 to just under 7,000 left to this day. All right. Well, we all know that ice cream is awesome, but I'll bet you didn't know that it also promotes peace. That's the mission of Buza, the gourmet ice cream chain co-founded by a Jewish and an Arab dessert chef who just won a peace prize from the United Nations for their delicious treat. Adam Ziv is from Kibbutz Sasa, and ever since he was a kid, he's dreamed of nothing but ice cream. Alas Suetat, on the other hand, grew up in the Arab village of Tarshia, a place where they didn't even have ice cream, just sorbet. But history was made years ago when Ziv found himself in the restaurant where Suetat was working. Both of them agreed to open up their first Buza ice cream parlor right in the middle of the Arab village. Boasting classic flavors as well as totally original local blends, the chain quickly took off and now has five locations across northern Israel and Tel Aviv. The two co-founders share the same dream of bringing together Jews and Arabs with the universally loved delicacy, and they hope that when families come to their parlor, kids end up playing together and parents begin talking with one another as well. Now, the joint Jewish-Arab business has just made history by landing Israel's very first peace prize of its kind from the United Nations. And I don't know about you, but all this talk of ice cream isn't just making me hungry, it's actually making me kind of happy too. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Just this week, the United Nations Security Council unanimously voted on increasing sanctions against North Korea, a punishment of sorts for their continued development of nuclear weapons. So today's word is onesh, meaning punishment. There are all sorts of different types of onesh, and they range in severity from a few minutes in timeout to the whole world banding together against you. Some say an onesh isn't the best way to dissuade people from certain actions, but the bottom line is if you want to avoid an onesh, you really just have to follow a few simple rules. Try really hard not to break the law, be honest, and put yourself in the shoes of others as often as you can, preferably without breaking the first two rules. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear with a light breeze and a low of 75 or 24 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow will be partly cloudy and you can expect the heat wave to continue with the daily highs reaching 90 or 32 degrees Celsius and above. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.52 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.